I am able to see all of you from a side camera, and also my wife Patricia turned on the phone, so I can somehow hear you guys anyway. So today is a very unusual situation. I uh, started last yesterday when our administrator PC was saying that she contacted COVID, and I thought that you know uh, we were meeting each other and a whole lot of people. So I thought somewhere down the line, it will be something that will happen to us, me as well. And yesterday morning, I was uh, basically trying to test myself and I was tested negative. And I went out to do some artwork with children suffering from cancer. And when I came back, I thought I better test myself again. And that's where I realized I was positive. So I needed to go tell the whole world about this. And I want to, first of all, as you can see, I'm okay. It's just that I have a little bit of sore throat and the voice got a little bit deeper. Uh, during the vaccination time, I got very sick, you know, when you were uh, vaccinated and I was out of action for almost three days. And people were telling me that when that happened, it means that your body immunity actually is very strong. It's actually fighting the vaccination. It's like you, you have a rock, rock whaler as a dog in your house. So any enemy that come in, the dog will react very strongly. Now, if you have a, if you got vaccinated and there's no reaction whatsoever, that means your guarding dog is probably a poodle or something like that, <laughs> or, or, or golden retriever who will just welcome anybody into the house. So I guess because of that, right, that very strong reaction, now I'm quite okay. I just have a little bit of sore throat and very slight fever and, and that's about it. So I want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, Brother Winston and Edwin, especially for scrambling uh, to get all these things up uh, and getting everything done in such a short period of time. Uh, I'm going to be, of course, sharing the message with you today, after which Brother Winston will carry on from there because it's going to be a little bit tricky to try to uh, arrange the rest with me in a Zoom area. Uh, but today, also, I want to appreciate my wife, Patricia. She brought down all the Father Day's gift that actually they prepared. Uh, she and my daughters prepared by hand, okay, by the way. So, uh, uh, and uh, it's something that we want to acknowledge to Father's Day. Can I invite all the fathers to stand among us? Would you please stand up, fathers? I can actually see you. So, yeah, okay, cool, very good. Uh, I cannot tell whether we our children are around. Usually we get our children to pass the father, father they give. So now I, I don't know. Those people who used to be children before can, can pass the gifts. <laughs> Would we pass the gift to the fathers and then let's do a prayer for the fathers among us. Would we do that, please? Yeah. I need Edwin to text me when all the fathers have already received the gift because the video is a bit small. I can't quite see clearly. <laughs> well, fa Father's Day is uh, often a day that's less celebrated than Mother's Day, right? We always say in Chinese, 母亲节吃餐馆, 父亲节吃罐头, uh. So, <laughs> that means the Mother's Day you go to a restaurant and Father's Day you just open up the canned food. <laughs> but it's good. Ah, yeah, okay, I see the kids, wonderful. Okay, cool. After all the fathers have received the gift, uh, let's pray together. Do we have everything? <clears throat> Are we done? Edwin, can you, can you uh, text me to tell me whether all the fathers have received the gifts? Anyone else? Okay. 
Okay, cool. All right, good. Let's pray together then. Let's pray together. We thank you, God Almighty, for giving us fathers in our life and for being most of all our Heavenly Father, who is, of course, the most exemplary Father that can ever be. And for those of us who are standing before you, including your servant, who has the privilege of fatherhood, grant to us the understanding that we are to emulate you in a way that you have provided for the world and have protected and cared for all of us. Help us to be truly thankful for all the roles that you have designed for us in our life. May we lift up the expectations that you have given to us so that we will establish good and strong families in this world. Sometimes we think that we need to do really great things for you. But one of the most fundamental things we really do need to do is to simply live well and have happy and strong family. And by that, we will then lift up the name of Jesus in wherever we may be. So we place all these fathers before you and also those who are not with us today squarely into your mighty hands and ask that you bless and keep them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now we want to carry on with our expository preaching today. And uh, let me then now call out to you the slides relating to it. Okay, cool. Now, we want to then now think about what was uh, taught in the last lesson. Uh, last lesson, we were on the first portion of First Timothy chapter 3, right? We just started First Timothy chapter 3. And, and immediately, we talked about qualifications of two groups of people. The first group will be the overseers. Uh, and so today, we will do the qualification number two. But the first one, I just entitled it qualification number one. So it's really about leadership role in the church. And the specific role was given to a group of people called the overseers. And the overseers here uh, would be, uh, depending on, on which denomination you are thinking about, the overseers uh, can be elders. It can be people who are called the bishops because there's a really a wide variety of uh in church governance. So I started out also quite simply by telling you that there are many different group of people. You have the Roman Catholic, you have the Anglican uh, Episcopal system, then you have congregation system. So many, many different kind of system in the church governance. I also highlighted to you some emerging new church governance, especially the one with uh, Pastor Francis Chan in America, which is, in my opinion, quite a fascinating and something that's worthy of studying a little bit further. Francis Chan's idea really is a home church idea. Uh, the thing that's quite attractive to me is the fact that they can really save a lot of money and use the money to support mission work and to support a lot of the charitable work among the poor. And basically the whole uh, reason why there are so many variations is because the Bible did not does not give a very detailed description of all these various church governors. It's just a very broad uh, description. So that's why it then came up with so many different variations. And generally speaking, if a church is very focused on traditions, then it will put a lot of emphasis on having bishops and cardinals like the Roman Catholic Church or the Anglican Church. Whereas else if a church is less concerned about tradition, more concerned about what the Bible say, then it will be a lot simpler because the Bible does not have many, many complicated description of church governance. So then some of the brethren churches, uh, which are very literal in the way they try to uh, understand the Bible, will have very, very simple governance model, only elder and just deacons. And for, the, for us, the Reformed Evangelical Church is somewhere in the middle, under the leadership of the senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Tong. Uh, his idea is that our whole structure is pretty Presbyterian in nature. So we have elders, we have deacons, we have synods. At the same time, he elevates the position of the servants of God. So the Hamba Tuhans, which are Indonesian for servants of God, uh, in our setting is considered uh, one's, one rank above, we will use the word one rank above. And the Apostle Paul, when he then spoke about <coughs> overseers, used the word noble task. And uh, do you remember this? I, I, I kept asking you, right, if this is such a noble task, how come 
so few of you want to do a task like that. And of course, uh, this is because, first of all, even from the verses that we were talking about, there are really stringent requirements. And the Apostle Paul listed out all these various requirements that uh, is needed just to be considered as an overseer. You must be a husband or one wife, you must be above, uh, we, we, we build. You must have a very good reputation, cannot be drunken. So it's a very stringent requirement. And it is a reminder to us all that we really are supposed to give the best to the Lord, not the rest to the Lord. So the best of our children, the best of us really should be reserved for the Lord as well. And maybe because of that, people tend not to want to do a work like that. The second reason I list out to you is that the work of an overseer or a someone in leadership position in church really is a work that's immersed fully into a worldview that is really completely different from the rest of the world. That the things that make the rest of the world happy, the things that make the rest of the world sad, the things that make the rest of the world angry, when you apply it to ministry, is can be quite different. And so, you know, the rest of the world, for example, plays a lot of emphasis on comfort, a lot of emphasis on money, um, recognition and stuff like that. And but in ministry work, it's, it's not something that we really put a lot of emphasis on. So the overseer, as Paul said, cannot be a lover of money. So with that alone, a, a lot of criteria is, is is not something which people like because you know people generally think that if you go and become a church pastor or whatever, it means that you have to be poor and and so the values are not worthy, so to speak. So therefore, why would anyone want to do this job? I mean, it, it sounds terrible. Plus, not, not forgetting that Jesus Christ said that after you've done all you have done, Luke chapter 17, you need to say, I am just an unworthy servant. I have just done my job. So no formal recognition, so to speak, even from the Lord, you know. And also remember John 10, Jesus said that a good overseer should be like him, good shepherd, and not a hired hand. Hired hand are somebody who just, you know, get the money and then do the job and then disappear. But if you really want to be a good overseer, a good servant of God, you need to be someone who truly loves the flock, not run away when danger comes. So why? Why we want we want to do this? The answer is because it is indeed, as Paul said, a noble task. And I want, wanted to really share with you that the ultimate joy in life is actually found in ministry. When I was very young, there was one time I was doing translation for the Reverend Kenny Yo. That's my pastor when I was growing up, Hainanese speaking kind of a pastor. So he was speaking Hainanese and translate to English because one of the key places we always go to are funerals. So it's a lot of funerals. And uh, usually the deceased is a person who speaks Hainanese and the children cannot understand Hainanese. So that's why I get to uh, translate from Hainanese to English. And there was one, one particular occasion I remember the deceased had a son-in-law, I, I think, who is a preacher. So after Dr. Uh, Reverend Yo and I finished our task, he came to see, see me and he said to me, a son be a preacher is the best job you can ever have in life. And I've never forgotten it, you know, and he was, uh, uh, and he's right because it is a noble task. And there is also an incomprehensible return of investment. For those of you who are finance trained and all that, the ROI is beyond the roof. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, that even when you give someone a glass of water for the sake of ministry, because that person is one among us, your reward will not be forgotten. And from there, it is very clear to me that anything associated directly with the word of God has a return that is most unusual. But the thing about it is that a lot of us don't quite see it, right? So I ended by telling you the example of Thomas. And Thomas, the apostle, really was someone who did not believe. After three and a half years of living with our Lord Jesus Christ, he still did not believe the resurrection. And only when Christ showed himself to him that Thomas immediately said, my Lord and my God. And so I do believe that the closer we are with Jesus Christ, the more we understand his truth, the more we will come to that stage where we will say that indeed, this is a noble task. I want to serve God more 
this is not to say that all of us will be overseers or pastors and all that, right? But at the very least, within our system, for those people who are not into full-time ministry, you can aspire to at least be an elder, uh, let alone go into full-time ministry. But no matter how, everything you do in life, whether you want to finally become an elder or a deacon or whatever, anything that is associated pretty directly with God, you must know that it is a different ballgame. Something which will bring us uh, joy and understanding beyond other work. So while we do believe that all work are sacred, and this is part of my regular preaching, at the same time, we acknowledge also that the work that's directly associated with God is in a different category altogether. Now, today we will then go on to the next segment, uh, which deals specifically with deacons. Let's come to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, for helping us to be able to even have a worship service, despite the fact that there are so many issues with COVID and what have you. And thank you for the provision of technology that your servant can still be talking to his people. And even in the church camp later, we do want to pray that you grant us appreciation for this so that we know that we are given the opportunity that few have in this world. So may we listen to you intensely and with humility in our hearts so that we can be taught. May our heart be prepared like good soil and your word enter into our heart and take root and bear fruit in our life. A special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and a meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are truly our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, cool. Now, um, so when we think about the early church governance model, right, when the Apostle Paul first wrote all these things, you must know that from the model itself, um, oh, uh, from the model itself, we are talking about, uh, first, you have a apostle. So that's the first thing that happened. You, The apostles are the one that basically are the one who established the early church and are able to be the one who demonstrated great signs and wonders uh, and are able to then uh, show that they, they are the one who have been appointed by God to do this very, very special thing. Uh, give me a moment, please. I, I need to so that I need to switch the thing to a more uh, presental view. Give me a moment, sorry. How do I do a full white screen thing? Uh, okay, never mind. Let me carry on first. Okay, so first you have the early churches, the authors of the New Testament. So these are people whom the Lord has appointed. And they are not your usual person, okay? So therefore, we do not believe that you can have apostles today. Uh, I know that there are charismatic churches whose leaders are called apostles. This is completely not what Reformed Evangelicals believe because those are were the early people out there who were given very specific roles by God and given a lot of supernatural ability as well. However, after that, everywhere that the apostle went, there were people who were overseers and there were deacons as well. So overseers, as we mentioned last week, are typically people who are supervisors of the local churches. Whereas deacons, which is the group that we are going to discuss today, are people who serve in basic practical matters like helping the poor. In the early church, the the early church did not just suddenly happen in the middle of nowhere. They were following the traditions of the Jewish people. And in the Jewish community, there were already some people who were, uh, what is the word? Who were already folks who are doing work among the poor. So even among the Jews, there were people who every single two weeks or so, be visiting the orphans, visiting the uh, poor people and trying to then uh, help them with their physical needs, collecting money and distributing among the poor people within the Jewish community. 
So therefore, the early church actually extended that a little bit more formally with the establishment of the deacons who takes care of this physical need. Now, in the word of the Bible, the word deacons that was used in today's passage is diakonos, which literally means a waiter, a servant, a person who performs some kind of a very media task, an administrator person. Now, this is then different from an overseer, right? Because an overseer is someone who is a supervisor. So therefore, to think that you are a deacon, certainly in the early church, is to think that you are like a waiter. Now, in your second responsive reading, I pick for you Acts chapter 6. And that's the source of where this word, diakonos, came from. Verse 1. Now, in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, which are the Jews who are Greek educated, arose among against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So that's what I'm talking about, right? The community of people who serve the poor and serve the widows and the orphans. And the 12, the, the 12 disciples, so there were the 11 apostles minus Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus and then killed himself. He was replaced by Matthias. They summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching and the word of God to serve tables, right? So <clears throat> it is interesting that the word to serve table uh, is being used here. It means that you, you are talking about uh, serving table, you know, it is a menial kind of a task. And um, therefore, brothers, speak out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and we will appoint them to this duty. So we appoint them to serve tables. We appoint them to distribute food to the widows and the orphans. We appoint them to all this administrative kind of a role. Uh, because we, the apostles and the key disciples and also the overseers, needed to focus very much on prayer and to the ministry of the work. So verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and ministry of the work. So we see here an establishment of a segregation of duty. The apostles and the overseers are people who take care of the spiritual things. And then you have a second group, those who serve the Hebrews, which are going to be the deacons. So herein lies some key reason why the segregation was happened that way. And then all the way till today, that's the kind of understanding that we have. However, I need you to know that uh, the deacons, therefore, are not just handyman or some technician kind of person, right? Because the early description is that they were supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with wisdom as well. So although the deacons were people who were supposed to be serving tables, it doesn't mean, therefore, that they are not spiritual people, you know. It just so happened that they are maybe not uh, too suited to lead or to teach or to preach, but that doesn't mean that they were like, you know, lousy people. You know that because in verse 5, and then when they said preach the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicardo and Timon and Parmenas, Nicholas, proselyte of Antoine. And, and the early apostles treated it very seriously. These they sat before the apostles and they prayed and laid hands on them. So therefore, in some churches, uh, the Installation of the deacons is considered very serious too. They will lay hands on them based on Acts 6. 6. Different churches have different tradition for this. And verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So, so now you have a deacon who not only served table, he was able to do signs and wonders. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, so you see here that just because you are a deacon does not therefore mean that you are lesser uh, or that you should be treated like some, you know, nobody kind of uh, situation. We have deacons here who can do great signs and wonders. Maybe the overseers cannot even do that. And we know about Stephen, right? If you read the next chapter, you'll find that he was persecuted for preaching the gospel and he became the first martyr for Jesus Christ in the very next chapter. So you know that he got stoned and he saw a crown and uh, Paul at that time was Saul, who was not even a convert yet, was kind of participated in the persecution 
or Stephen. So therefore, one of the key lessons we do learn from here is that while overseers and elders are mainly focused on spiritual matter, teaching, preaching, prayer, and leadership, generally speaking, deacons are mainly focused on physical needs of the poor, administrative matter of the church, what we call hand and kind of leg work. At the at at the <coughs> it is clear that although both qualifications are kind of the same, Paul wanted people to know that the elders and the supervisors are doing a role that deserves higher honor, so to speak. In the later chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So it's very clear that the servants of God, the people who are elders, whether they are teaching elders or ruling elders, teaching elders being the ministers, ruling elders usually the lay people who are elders in church, they are to be considered worthy of double honor especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So your preachers, your ministers and all that are to be honored more by the, what the Apostle Paul says. So therefore, uh, how do we then uh, demonstrate this? In Reformed churches, the title of an elder is for life, but the title of a deacon is not for life. So most Presbyterian churches, for example, elder so-and-so, once you are ordained as an elder, forever they will address you elder so-and-so. And when you die, you put the name the title elder in your tombstone but you don't do that for deaconship so that's one kind of slight way that people show uh, at the same time always remember this from the example of Stephen, there is no reason to think that deacons cannot also do spiritual work it is a at the same you flip it the other way around there's also no reason to think that overseer and elder cannot do manual work i in particular am a pastor who will do manual work now, we try, for example, to arrange for uh, cell groups and all that to come to our church to clean up the church. Now, you may ask why we bother to do that. Why don't we just hire somebody to do church cleaning? The answer, of course, is that you want to encourage people to treat the church as if it is their own home and to get involved. And, of course, I am influenced by Habitat for Humanity in this kind of concept where you, I mean, it's very easy to write a check and give money to the poor. It's a lot harder to then say, I'm going to go there and build a house. Or it's the same thing with church, right? It's very easy to say, let's hire some auntie somewhere to do cleaning. A lot harder to say that I'm going to set aside time, go there and clean the church. Now, guess what? If you guys don't want to clean the church, and our oh, administrator, Christy, is telling me that, hey, you know, nobody clean the church. Guess who will do it? I will do it, you know? I mean, it's not a problem for me. I will come down, wash the toilet, like clean the place and, and vacuum the place because I don't think that's the problem and I'm very happy to, to do that. So therefore, there is no hard and fast rule to, to say that the deacon must do nothing but all the manual work and, and non-spiritual work. Whereas the elders are only focused on spiritual work, he, he, they're not going to touch the toilet at all. Like what we have explained in the complementarianism sermon about the role between men and women. The focus here is functional focus. So you can say that ontologically the same, but functionally different. So the idea is that we are all the same, but you are not to then segregate people into so many categories and be so hard and fast about this. Not only that, all of us who are servants of God, whether you are deacon or elder, or somebody who is serving in a cell group or whatever it is, no matter how big or small, you must remember that it is always a privilege to serve. And it, it's not about you. It is about the privilege that God has given to you. Just last week, I came across a saying. Uh, I, I don't know why I've never seen this saying before. It's quite a fascinating saying because it has to do with a tortoise on a post. <laughs> it's supposed to be some African saying, but apparently in uh, America, a lot of people have this saying too. Uh, what does it mean? That if you walk down the street and you see a tortoise on top of a post, uh, that means a, a stick, uh, you can be very certain that it did not get up there itself. Am I right? If you see a tortoise on top of a post like that, no way the tortoise will climb up the post by himself, right? It must be some naughty kids that pick up the tortoise and put it on the post. Servants of God are like the same. 
we do what we do simply because God placed us in ministry. We did not get into ministry ourselves. Like the tortoise did not get up to the post by itself. And it is all by God's grace. So therefore, like I always say to you, if after you have finished doing your work, whether you are a pastor, a cell leader, a nice Christian person who helps someone in whatever role you are doing, if all the people remember is that, oh, this young Teng Ming is such a wonderful guy, he's such a wonderful preacher, blah, 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 then you are in trouble, you know, because you have just robbed the glory from God. And we are not to do that. We are like the tortoise on a post. No way it is because of me. It is all because of God. So let us always remember that. I suppose if you remember this a little bit better, you will be able to uh, kind of uh, 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 not, not get too confused, actually. So remember that from the example of Stephen, no reason to think that deacons cannot do spiritual work. No reason to think that elders cannot do manual work. Like complementarism, focus should be functional, ontologically the same, functionally different. All right, let's then now go to the qualifications, right? Last week, I didn't really go into the key qualifications because uh, I wanted to just talk about the broad understanding of how the work of God is considered a noble task. When we look at the qualification of deacons this, for this week, right, the, the passage, you see that the qualification compared to last week, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, and today is uh, 8 to 13. They are very similar. Do you notice that? Uh, almost exactly the same, except that the overseer has able to teach and not much different in that. Because the focus for church leadership actually is about character. And so both the qualification for the overseers and the qualification for the deacons are both heavily focus on the idea of character. And John MacArthur Jr., the, the pastor that co often put it this way, according to scripture, virtually everything that truly qualifies a person for leadership is directly related to character. It is not about style, status, personal charisma, clout, or worldly measure of success. Integrity is the main issue that makes the difference between a good leader and a bad one. And this is a very serious uh, understanding. It's about character. It is not about whether you're a very good preacher, you can wow the crowd, you can bring in the people. Uh, these days also, you know, all this praise and worship thing, right? Whether you're a good song leader, can you get the people to sway and, and, and to, to lift their hands up as if they don't care and then you worship the Lord. Or that? It's not. Martha Jr. said it's all about character, which means that if your character is lousy, you are involved in fraud. You, 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 you have character flaws and you're involved in adultery and stuff like that. No way in our understanding would you qualify. So remember that. And we see that clearly in the verses that have been listed by the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm not going to go into every single thing because uh, it's a little bit long. I only want to touch on some character issues that are important for ministry and also based on my own interaction and my own observation to the years, what are some of the things that are much more relevant to us today? So I'm going to bring three only. I'm not going to touch, for example, on things like drunkenness because thankfully it's still not an issue for us. I don't know. Maybe unless you're drunk all the time, you don't tell me. At least I don't get to encounter it. So I'm going to focus on things that I am more familiar with and I think also the things that we need to be careful about. The first Character thing would be you need to be dignified and you need to be a respected person. So from the very first uh, qualification for deacons, deacons likewise must be dignified. And when the Apostle Paul used the word dignified, the original Greek is samnos, which again has a, 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 a wide variety of description. Maybe reverend, honorable, serious, respected, dignified, respected by others. Not somebody who is xiao xiao and uh, you know flippant in your attitude because people cannot take you seriously because you half the time talking nonsense and you're not a serious minded kind of person. This calls to mind the fact that leadership, not just in church actually, but in any aspect of life, need to be one in which people have emotional and spiritual maturity. 
especially in church leadership. Unhappily, it doesn't seem to be the case today, right? Especially with Donald Trump and all these people who really quite crazy right, in the United States. And even when I say that, some members of our congregation will get upset because we have some diehard Trump supporter among us, you know. Uh, you really cannot use the word dignified when you describe a Trump presidency, right? There's so many weird stuff that's going on right there. And the Bible says that that must not be the case for us. And one of the things that surprised me really in ministry is how immature people can be, both emotionally and spiritually. And it's something which boggles my mind. Why is it that it takes so long for a human being to reach maturity? And you know, this is not just about emotional uh, situation. When you compare the human being with the rest of the animal in the animal kingdom, you find that the human being takes a long, long time to reach maturity. I, I found this chart, which I thought is quite interesting. The difference between a human and a, a hamster. I know some of you got hamster as pets, right? So when your hamster is one month old, he the hamster is already living equivalent to a human being with three years. So in human years, it's already three years. When your hamster is six months old, it is equivalent to a 20-year human lifespan. So there it goes. But you know what the key is? The key is that when the hamster is one month old, he already lives 4% of his life, right? Normal lifespan. When the human being is three years old, it lives also right about there. But maturity comes for the hamster at six months, at which time the hamster already lived a quarter of his lifespan and a human being only lived about 10% of his lifespan, which means that the hamster mature a lot faster. And we're talking about physical maturity here. Lah. And, and it's true, you know, human being, we, we take a very long time for our babies to grow, to be independent. There was this uh, sunbird that, set up shop outside my balcony. Love it, you know, you see the sunbird, daddy and mommy come and fly in, fly there, and build a nest, right? Some of you may have the same experience and they lay two eggs inside there and two baby sunbird was there. And I'm fascinated by it. I went to take people on Facebook and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. One fine day, I went to take a look. The two babies were gone. And could it be that my cat ate the two babies? Answer is no. La. My cat is like, lazy is not the right word to describe it. La. It's <laughs> beyond lazy. I think if the bird dropped in front of the cat, the cat would just yawn. Right? Uh, so it's not a cat. So I went to search on the internet and I found out that the sunbird babies, you know, at a certain stage, uh, it will just take off and fly off, you know. So, it, you know, it's like a baby and it doesn't have to spend a lot of time practicing flying, so to speak. It can just simply take off and fly off. Now this compared to the human being is a, is a different ballgame. And somehow or other, it is a very strange thing that we tend to take a long, long time to reach maturity or to be dignified in our life. And so sometimes when I deal with marital issues and or personal issues and all that, it's quite clear to me that, hey man, you, you, you are already, I don't know, 50 years old, you're still acting as if you're 15 years old. It's a very simple thing. Why is it that you are not thinking straight, you know? So all the more a reason for us to remember that we, we shouldn't just simply keep saying that this is who I am. We need to learn to grow, to mature, to be at a stage where we are dignified. The second thing I want to tell you is that with that dignified issue, the Apostle Paul very quickly brought in the issue of tongue control. After saying that you need to be dignified, the very first thing, not double tongue. And not only did he say that the deacon should not be double tongue, the wife also. Wife likewise must be dignified, not slanderous. And this is something that is really, really, let me put in one more really, 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 really important. And I will tell you that for all the ministry work that I've done, if you ask me, what is the one thing that stands out uh, that brings a lot of chaos and a lot of difficulty, I say tongue control, because I see that among the lowest ranking people in church, and I also see that among the highest ranking people in church, that you 
basically, you know, there's just a lot of you say, I say, he say, they say, the my mother say, the wet market auntie say, my grandfather say, you say, that I say, it is just crazy. A lot of repeating of that. Even among husband and wives, when you are fighting with one another, it's just crazy the way some of you guys have serious problem with tongue control. And you just, when you are angry, you just open your mouth and say all kinds of nonsense. Guess what? Once, once you say something, it, it may be forgiven, but it cannot be forgotten. You know what I mean? It's not something that can be erased. You know, it's not like you're erasing some videotape, you know. It's something that then go into the mind of people. This particular area is so important that the Apostle James says in James 3, 2, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. So this is one definition from the scripture as to what perfection means. If you can find someone who will not stumble in what he or she will say, this person is a perfect person because this person is able to bridle the whole body. Of course, we are not like that. We are people who are fallen. And therefore, we would then go around and talk to people. And then, you know, when we talk and all that kind of thing, and they can get very messy. And again, as I tell you, it's not just about pretty entry-level workers, also among the most senior of church workers. Uh, it's just a lot of problem relating to what you say, what he say, what they say, and all that. So what are some of the things we can do to mitigate it? I came across this and I thought I wanted to share with you. Uh, it's an acronym that helps us to, to speak better, I suppose. And uh, it's a very difficult to trace where this acronym comes from. And I'm a pastor who don't usually use acronym. Some pastors use acronym for everything. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, some letter, each letter represents something. So I, I don't do that. But this one I find to be quite useful. So I want to introduce to you. Before you speak, think. What does that mean? First of all, T-H-I-N-K. T stands for, is it true? I think this is the most important thing. Is this true? And as I have preached to you often time, uh, and this is one of the key emphasis in my preaching, the truth is everything. And the truth will set us free. As Jesus Christ said in John 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set us free. And we often think that that it refers to gospel truth. Of course it does. At the same time, I definitely think that that understanding is expanded to cover every aspect of life because God is true and God is truth himself. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. So before you say something, you must ask yourself, is it true? Before you go out and say, hey, that guy is whatever, 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 is this true? Or you look at your husband or look at your wife and say, you are whatever, whatever, whatever. Is this true? Or is this just something that you get angry and you want to say what you, you want to say? And if our minds is always tuned towards this idea of really true, being truth-based, we are less likely or will be more reluctant to just spill out and talk nonsense and try to you know, say whatever we want. So ask yourself, is it true? And when it comes to H, even if it is true, is it helpful? And that's what HIP stands for. I mean, I can tell you some truth. Is it helpful? Uh, one example for sometimes people ask, right? The elderly person who is very sick, the guy is like 90 years old, and the doctor say that, hey, you know, guy got only three months to live. So that's the truth. That's a fact. Would you go and tell the old person, hey, by the way, you only have three months to live? I don't think so, right? Then you say you are lying. It's not helpful. It's not going to help him because his lifespan is already coming to the end rather than have him struggle like crazy and always worried about just having three months and counting down. I think it's a, not a helpful thing to do. So that is a good guidance as well. Is it inspiring? Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be something that will help the other person? Uh, and N is important. Is it necessary? Is it necessary? Do you need to go tell that person that's whatever it is. A lot of us don't think about things like that, right? We just go and blare whatever we want to talk about, even though the information may not be necessary. And finally, K is, is it kind? 
is it a kind thing to do? To go tell people whatever it is that you're going to say. And I think that if you go through this list and you are very careful with the way you control your tongue, asking yourself, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? I, I think that it will guide us away from creating a lot of trouble by being double tongue slandering and cutting out all kinds of nonsense. But this is a lifelong practice. And I'll tell you that I practice this myself. Oftentimes, I, I will remind myself, I want to think before I speak, right? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? So that before I open my mouth and say something, I want to be clear that this is the case as well. Okay, then the next one the Apostle Paul brought up is first, a, a dignified work. Second, tongue control. The third emphasis he had was self-discipline. And we see that in verse 12. Let deacons each be husband of one wife, managing their children and their own household as well. Now, husband of one wife doesn't mean that you are just married to one person only. And that's as simple as that. When the Apostle Paul wrote this in the early church, people had many wives and also were promiscuous and did not really care very much about their spouse or, or, or loving them. Now, when we were talking about complementarianism and we were talking about how in the Reformed Evangelical Church, we do believe in male leadership. Uh, ontologically, the same, functionally different. I, I, I guarantee you somehow people still feel that, hey, that's very male chauvinistic. You guys are always thinking about male, whatever it is. Now, yesterday, there's a pink dot thing that went on, right? So we are now in a world where, wow, people just come with all kinds of ideas and kind of thing and push against the biblical truth. And we will have more issues coming to it uh, in the future. <laughs> but what people don't realize actually is that when all these verses were written, the positioning of the women is really nothing, you know. So the fact that the, the Bible actually elevated the status of a woman by demanding that the man be a husband or one wife, it was a most revolutionary thing to happen in the early church because now the woman is no longer just an object. She now has become an equal partner with the husband. Although we, we would say, like I tell you, they can discuss whatever you want. At the end of the day, we believe that after every discussion is done and you need to call a shot and make a decision and you have an impasse, then we believe that the man would make the decision. So that's our understanding. But I'm telling you that there's a night and day difference between Christianities coming in to implement those ideas versus the old ideas that these people had in those days because they got nothing. So now, in the Christian understanding, you are to be faithful to your wife, husband or one wife, and to honor her and to respect her and to lift her up. And if you cannot do that, because we have now described that your spouse is the closest person you will ever have in your life. If you cannot do that, then we say that maybe you also cannot kind of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you 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 cannot be trusted for something else because you are not even faithful to the person who is closest to you. Long time ago, corporations used to fire key employees for committing adultery. Uh, I read that IBM, the founder Tom Watson, used to fire people for adultery because they are understanding that if you cannot be faithful to the person closest to you, how can you then be faithful to your company? So along the same line. The idea is that if you're not even faithful to your spouse, how can we expect you to be faithful to the word of God? Exactly as the qualification of the overseer say, if you cannot manage your own household, how can you manage the household of God? So this require discipline. This require, re require a very solid attitude towards the work that has been laid before you. So dignified, not double tongue, self-discipline, one more tested by time. And this is important. The Apostle Paul added, let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Now I said that the qualification is similar to 
that overseer, right? So you go up a few verse, verse 6. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. So this is why for some churches, they draw a age limit for certain roles. Like for example, elders ought to be 40 years old and above, something like that. Uh, I'm an exception case. I was ordained as an elder at 33 years old. At that time, the youngest in the English-speaking Presbyterian churches. And even for me, at that time, I felt that maybe I'm too young to do this because you do need the passage of time to test something, especially when it comes to human integrity issue. And this is a bit paradoxical. It's not a question of whether you are very intelligent or very smart or whatever it is. Uh, some things in life, you need the passage of time to affirm, to convict, to have a better understanding. Now, those of you who studied Mandarin in schools, right? One of the earliest Chengyi or the proverbs that we learn is this one. Lu yao zi ma li, re jiu jian ren xing. Uh, I hope you, your Chinese is, you didn't throw it away. Uh, you, I hope you know what this means. This is a, one of the most common kind of observation by Chinese proverb. In translation is with a long journey, one will know a horse's strength. Uh, so you, you have a horse, right? How do you know whether it's a good horse or not? If the journey is very long, then if it's a good horse, it can last the journey. A lousy horse, halfway, you give up. Ah, but when it comes to the human heart, with the passage of time, one would know a person's heart. So herein lies some of the most paradoxical thing about ministry work. And it's about it, time will really prove the integrity of that person. So that's one of the things that I do appreciate about working with Dr. Stephen Tong because he, he, one of the things he said is that the theology of time is something which very few people preach. And he have a pretty sensitive understanding to that. So when, we, when he started the Reformed Evangelical Church, he did not immediately go and establish all these deacons or elders or what have you. In fact, it took him 23 years before he ordained the first elder. 23 years is a long time. Uh, and if you were to ask him why it took so long, he said he wanted to make sure that the people who actually are ordained finally are people who will last the distance, who will be with us through the distance. And so it is with our English service as well. We have not moved into the establishment of deacons yet. For me, I am not too uh, excited about all these things yet because really the idea that Dr. Tong told me is that you get together a group of co-workers and you, you then work together and in due time, those people who are really not committed or have an un unresolved issue, they will drop out. And in due time, what you are left with will be people who really understand what this is all about. And the right people will then come together to form a formal leadership. And I pray that that's what it is for us as well. And yeah, throughout the days and throughout the years, you do see people falling out and, you know, getting angry over pretty trivial things in my opinion. And okay, fine, if you don't want to co-work with us over such trivialities, then yeah, I suppose time is the great filter here. But the truth of God is to be uh, to, to be affirmed. Proverbs 12, 19, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. So the test of time is a very, very important aspect of ministry as well. So, okay, so when we put all these things together, right, uh, the uh, Apostle Paul here then listed all the character reference and towards the end, again, he answered the question, why do you then do all these things? Earlier, last week, when we talked about why do we then want to aspire to do God's work, the answer, like I said, is it, was a, it is a noble task, and it, it, it still is, especially in overseer. And so for the overseer, verse 1 tells us that it is a noble task that we will aspire to, knowing that the work of the Lord is better than anything else. Again, I say to you, it doesn't mean that you who don't aspire to be an elder or whatever, are going to do with you. The same principle applies to everything you do in life. Anything that you do that is directly associated with God's work is a different category 
than other work that you do. For example, being a secular person. So that there is a difference. But for the deacons here, the passage ends with the reasoning, another reasoning or another two reasoning that he gave. For deacons, verse 13 says, for those who serve well as deacons, gain a good standing for themselves. Now, different people interpret it differently. Some people say that this means that you get a good standing before the Lord in the future when you come to see God again. Other people say that you get a good standing here now in your life. Because you serve well, people respect you, people honor you, people then would then uh, have you being promoted to be a deacon or to be an elder. So many church tradition follow that kind of line. So first, you need to be a deacon before you can be an elder. So for me, last time I was a deacon for three years. And then after that, I was elected elder uh, after the second term. So I was elected elder. So I was a deacon even younger than that. I was in my mid-20s only when I became a deacon. So I was a deacon for six years, then they elect you to eldership. So it's, it's following this thing, like you gain a standing for themselves, then you are prepared for a so-called higher role, so to speak. However, the one that I'm more interested in is the very last verse. And also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Paul said that when you get involved in church work, when you get involved in the work of God, when you get involved with eternal kingdom related work, in the end, you are the one who will gain a great confidence in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I testify to you that that's true. And, you know, there are many of us who come to church and we, we, we think that, you know, that's my du religious duty. I come to church and I attend worship service. Our faith is an experiential faith. It is something that you need to experience and to grow. And the paradox is that if the more you get involved, the more confidence you get. And the less you get involved, the less confidence you get. And that's definitely true. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said that to him who more is given, more will be added. To him who is given less, even that one less will be taken away. In other words, if you are a servant of God, or and as I mentioned, all of us are servants of God, you get involved in church work. The more you get involved, the more you learn. And the cycle is that the more you learn, the more you get involved, and, and on and on it goes. Conversely, if you sit down there and you say that, hey, man, this is not my thing, man. It's, it's their thing. The less um, you are involved, the more passive you are, even that little knowledge you, you know may be taken away from you. So I've always told you that among all the people who have learned from the expository preaching all these years, I am the one who gained the most, isn't it? Because I have to grapple with the text, whereas you are really one level below because you are just listening. And of course, a lot of you are taking notes and all that. That's great. But it's just different from when you have to preach, right? You have to deal with it. So it's the case with all of ministry. If you are a cell leader, for example, now you know that to be a cell leader is almost like to be a, a, a small pastor over a group of people. And you want to do a job better, you need to really think through, right? How do you lead all this cell group? How do you make it interesting? How do you care for the people, all that? If you keep saying that, hey, I don't want to be a leader, I just want to be the cell member, I don't do anything, then of course you don't get to learn. And this is the paradox of faith. In today, for example, because of this COVID thing, Brother Winston and Brother Edwin in particular, they really scramble, you know, especially Edwin. Later on, you can go and talk to him. Well, he has to go and quickly get things done and scramble and run around like crazy and set up shops and what have you. Uh, Winston, after I finish preaching here, I've asked him to then take over. He will then have to lead you in the Apostles' Creed, uh, lead you in prayer, sing the last song, do a closing prayer. I don't know whether he's panicking or not. I hope not. You know, uh, and if things go wrong a little bit here and there, please be patient. But I guarantee you, he would have learned something. And, and his knowledge and his confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ would then go a little bit further. Okay, so we are closing now the prayer for uh, the teaching relating to the overseer and deacons.
I want to remind you that at the end of the day, as the great missionary William Carey said, we should expect great things from God. At the same time, attempt great things for God. For that is the way we will grow with confidence in Christ Jesus. And I pray that you understand in our congregation that you should always attempt to extend yourself beyond yourself beyond where you are now. And by so doing, as scripture says, you come to a closer understanding of your faith. And it's all relative. If you have done nothing so far, you can always look for the next thing to do. Join a cell group, participate, grow. If you're already in a cell group, you may want to consider being a cell leader. If you're already a cell leader, you want to consider being someone who, who, who will then teach a lot more. It's just endless amount of things that can be done. And it's a marvelous thing to be able to be latching on to the word of God because it is indeed a noble task. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the lesson that we have learned. And we want to ask that you help us internalize it fully because like a lot of things, it can be just something that we just listen to and, and then it just passes us by. The fact is that our faith is an experiential faith. The more we practice it, the more we get involved, the more we extend the gift that you're given to us, the more we will grow, as Paul says, in the confidence of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Conversely, the less we do, the more passive we become, the more uninterested we are, the less we learn and the more doubts we get about what this faith is all about. So grant us the understanding, the clarity in mind, and more importantly, grant us the willingness to serve you and to continue to learn to grow and to learn in great joy that indeed it is a noble thing to want to be closer to you and to serve the people around us with the gifts that you've given to us. And the Bible says that all of us have gifts. Not possible that we have no gifts whatsoever to share with one another or to contribute with one another. So help us to understand that so that our journey of faith is a dynamic one, a joyful one, a constructive one, because that's how you have made us to be. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.